Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I honestly don't know how to follow the three talks that you've just heard, so I'm tempted to just say, have a nice night and sort of go whimpering off the stage. <laughs> but I, I was asked by the organizers here to say something about the Brown curriculum, about education at Brown. And I'm not sure why I'm particularly qualified to talk about that. It might be that in the summer between my junior and senior year, I roomed with a guy named Ira Magaziner, who many of you may know is sort of the father of what we used to call the new curriculum and what we now call the open curriculum. So I was sort of there at the creation. And I saw the student movement. And it was led by Ira and another guy named Elliot Maxwell that gave rise to the curriculum that we have at Brown. I wasn't involved in the student movement. I was much more involved in working in a laboratory, trying to become a researcher, doing other sorts of things. But Ira was always there, pushing people out into the green, assembling 1,000 students in front of University Hall, not to threaten to take it over, not to threaten the professors or the corporation, but to say, we want to change the curriculum. It was an extraordinary thing to see. I went off to graduate school at the University of Colorado, fully intending to become a researcher and imagining myself full time at the bench, maybe at Merck or Pfizer, the National Institutes of Health, or something along those lines. And a funny thing happened along the way. And that is, being a graduate student, I was exceptionally poor. I was trying to get by on a stipend of about 200 bucks a month. So I was willing to do literally anything I could to earn a little extra cash. I taught swimming lessons. I umpired slow-pitch softball in the intramurals. Um, I, I, you know, I would have been willing to sweep up around the dorm to earn a few extra bucks. And then I heard of a company at the university called Pink Elephant Notes. And what Pink Elephant Notes advertised is if you were, in a, if you were a student in one of these huge lecture classes, and introductory biology at Colorado at the time was taught in a theater that seated about 1,200 students. That's how many were in the class. For $15.95 of the sem a semester, think of the bargain, for $15.95 a semester, you could subscribe to pink elephant notes that were taken allegedly by a doctoral candidate in your field. They'd be typed up. And at the end of the week, you'd get these authorized notes taken by, the, taken by this brilliant person or working for a PhD in history or English or biology or chemistry or whatever. And I figured I'd try out for this position. So I tried out, and lo and behold, I got it. And it paid big bucks, $5 a lecture. So I was able to make 15 bucks a week. And that was serious money. That was enough money to go out on a Saturday. Oh, that's right. You guys don't go out. So never, don't worry about that. But that was enough money to give me a good Saturday night. So I was aided in this quest by the professor who taught the course, who was a brilliant, actually, a brilliant plant biochemist named Peter Albersheim. But Professor Albersheim got tangled up very often in his own explanations. And I would sit there in this huge auditorium, furiously taking notes. And then when the class ended, there was no class in there right after it, I would sit there by myself for about half an hour. And in my, on my note papers, I would draw a line. And I would then write, here's what Dr. Albersheim really meant today. And then I would try to extract the general ideas from his thoughts. And this became like a regular column in the pink elephant notes. And the sales, I was told, of the biology notes were just off the charts. And part of it was because I was working hard, but the other part is, God bless him, Dr. Albersheim was so confusing. <laughs> and one day, I'm sitting in class, and he was being more confusing than usual. And I was just working like crazy. And a student whom I did not know sitting next to me hit me in the elbow. And he said, why are you working so hard? And I said, I'm trying to get the notes down. Shut up. And he says, get them from the pink elephant. And I said, I am the pink elephant. <laughs> and he looked at me like I had said I was Brad Pitt. I mean, that's. So as it turns out, the next time I came to class and I went to my usual seat, not only was he there waiting for me, but five of, her fr five of his friends were too. And he said, would you tutor us? And I said, will you pay me? And they said, yes. And I figured, OK, I can make another 10 bucks a night doing this sort of stuff. And what I did was simply meet with them in a conference room in a dormitory and go over whatever they wanted to go over in that particular week in class. And I hadn't expected this, because I was concentrating simply on being a researcher. But I realized for the very first time, and I did this a couple times before I became aware of it, I would walk away from these sessions with a tremendous feeling of satisfaction. And I'm thinking, What's this coming from? I don't get it. 
And then I realized, and those of you who've taken my classes, it, it was the Krebs cycle. Um, I walked away from one of these sessions after I had sort of unraveled the Krebs cycle for these students, and I realized there is an enormous satisfaction that I now appreciate every instructor, every teacher knows, in trying to get through a difficult concept and suddenly seeing the light go on in somebody's head. And when you teach, and if you taught for a long time, it's almost a physical reaction. You can see the eyes open, the neck snaps back, the pulse quickens. It's just an extraordinary thing. And I realized for the very first time that I rather liked that, that I enjoyed that. So when I got my doctorate, I sought out a position where I could not only do first-rate research in a great university, don't worry, it wasn't this one, um, a great university, but also teach. And that surprised the people who hired me, because I had been hired basically to run a particular service laboratory and do my own research, and I knocked on the door of the dean and said, can I teach a little bit of introductory biology as well? And he looked at me like, you know, what's the drug going around today? Um, usually we have to threaten people to get them to teach intro courses in any subject, but there it was. And I discovered that I rather liked it. Now here's the interesting thing, the interesting part of this story vis-a-vis -vis this university. The place where I started out teaching is a place that defiantly has what it calls a core curriculum, a, a, a kernel of knowledge to which everyone is expected to repair, to which everyone is expected to master. And the, the central theme of this core, and it's true at almost every university in this country, is that it's possible to define a common core of knowledge that everybody ought to have by the time they leave university with a bachelor's degree. Now, that's a noble concept. I think it's a great idea. But in practice, it often falls down, and there's a couple of reasons for that. In my own field, in biology and in science in general, a core requirement that says everybody's got to take a life science course inevitably leads to a segregation of students. So in other words, you have that sort of life science or biology for poets that everybody's got to take. And then, to avoid the dreariness of that course, the department will set up a special biology course for the students we really do want to teach. And those are the students who are going to major in biology. So you have majors courses and non-majors courses and so forth. And I became intimately aware of how this works because for, oh, seven or eight years, I chaired the education committee of a major scientific society in this country. And one of my jobs was to run an education seminar for our members at our annual meetings. Meetings drew 15,000 scientists, but all of them teach in one respect or another. And I used to help organize workshops on how do you teach these introductory biology courses. And what I heard from colleague after colleague at other universities was these courses are just just dreadful to teach because the students who are in them by definition have been forced to be there. They got to get their tickets punched. As a result, the best professor, the most eloquent one in the department doesn't get the job of teaching those courses. It goes to the guy or the gal who's the lowest on the totem pole and it might not even go to a regular faculty member. Very often they're taught by adjunct faculty, somebody you pick off the street, you have a PhD, yes, great, here's $10,000, teach this course and keep these kids out of our hair for a semester. Um, so you have the worst of both possible worlds, which is students who don't really want to be there and a faculty member who really is not thrilled about teaching them. When I came to Brown, came, came back to Brown, because I'd been an undergraduate here, uh, in 1980, one of the first things I wanted to see is what happened to Ira Magaziner's dream? What happened to the new curriculum? And I'll tell you what I expected to see. The, 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 the central element of the new curriculum was to be something called the modes of thought course. These are courses that are going to have broad intellectual perspectives. They'll be taught in small groups. They'll be taught by distinguished tenure track faculty members. And they will concentrate on ways of thinking rather than simply rote memorization of content. So I, you know, I unpacked my bags, moved into my lab, and walked out in search of modes of thought courses and discovered that there weren't any of them, that they had become virtually extinct. And there's a number of reasons for that relating to the history of how these courses were supported or not supported. But what I did find was here was the open curriculum. And I immediately went to another dean and said, besides teaching the advanced cell bio course that you hired me to, I want to teach introductory biology. And he also had to be picked up off the floor. And he said, OK, fine, we'll go ahead and do this. 
And one of the things that I discovered right away was that this open curriculum made this a great place to teach science. And what I mean by that is we don't have a required life science course at this university. So what does that mean? It means that when I walk in to my course, Biology 200, it's now called, on the first day of the semester, there's three kinds of students in that class. There are students who know they want to major in biology or psychology, one of the life sciences. There are students who aren't sure what they want to major in, but they want to keep the door open to med school or something like that. And there are students who aren't going to major in science, don't want to be pre-med, but they just want to learn some biology, or they've heard it's an interesting course. But it means 100% of my students, in one way or another, have chosen to be there. What effect does that have on me, or any instructor, in a course like that? Well, the answer is it brings out the best in you. And it brings out the best in terms of effort. It also brings out the best in terms of demand, in terms of what you do, to do for your students and what you demand of them and expect of them. And it makes this an absolutely extraordinary place to teach. I also found this was an extraordinary place to do research. And the reason for that is the kind of faculty that are drawn here are not just faculty who want to do world-class research, but faculty who want to interact with each other. Um, compared to research departments and sciences at other universities, it's hard to build an empire at Brown. And by building an empire, I mean a laboratory in which the professor has six postdocs, 14 grad students, and 15 technicians working with them. Our labs, even the most distinguished faculty here, are relatively small. I also discovered that the laboratories here are populated with undergrads. For example, in biology last year, 81% of the students who graduated with a degree in biology had done at least one semester of independent study with a faculty member, and more than half of those had written senior honors thesis. And that's despite the fact that this is not required, and the honors thesis is not required. So that was an extraordinary thing. Now, in my very first semester teaching here, in my cell biology course, which I still teach, there are about 14, 15 students, I think I can re recall every one of those students by their face, by appearance, if not by name. And one of the people in that course was a tall guy, dark hair, his name was Craig. He didn't get the best grades in the class, but he was, quite frankly, a, 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 a real pain in the ass. And what I mean by that is Craig would never let me finish a lecture and get out of that room without almost literally throwing me up against the blackboard and asking me for more references, more questions. How's this, has this been done? Has something else been done? And it became annoying. It was annoying in a nice way, but it was still annoying. <laughs> when that semester was over, Craig parked himself in the lab next to mine in the Biomed Center because he was doing an honors thesis with a professor named Nelson Fausto. Um, because my lab was right next door and I had just set it up. I had all new chemicals, man. I had all new glassware, new power supplies, everything else. And Craig would come over and swipe the new stuff from my lab and sometimes break it and bring it back sheepishly. So we all learned. My technician, in fact, became quite upset. Um, wanted to ban Craig from the lab. I didn't ban him. But I did say, Craig, when you break something, you have to tell me. And he did, and so forth. And then I charged the other, you know, was, you know how this stuff works out. Well, um, Craig graduated. I knew he went to grad school. I kind of lost track of him. Uh, then about a decade, decade and a half later, I started to read scientific papers with his name on them. And I began to read the content of those papers. And I thought, oh my god. And three years ago, Craig Mello won the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology. And he won it. He's the only. Brown undergraduate graduate ever to win a Nobel Prize. And what, what Craig did is, to me, indicative of what the Brown education allows one to do. He and a colleague named Andrew Fire discovered a phenomenon which we now call RNA interference. And when you look at the history of this phenomenon, what you would discover is evidence for this process was in plain sight. People had been looking at it finding it in their experimental results for like 15 years. But no one had ever put the elements together to really try to explain the various phenomena until it came across Craig's, it came to Craig's attention. And if I have to say one thing about the educational system at Brown, the fact that it places such pressure on you as students to organize your own education, to make your own decisions, to, in effect, set up your curriculum. Because we're not going to tell you what that core is. You have to decide that for yourself. 
that it breeds people like Craig Mello who are able to basically say, wait a minute, there's something important here that everybody else has overlooked, and I'm going to synthesize it. I'm going to put it together, and I'm going to figure it out. That's not just an essential skill in science. That's part of the humanities. That's part of the arts. And in fact, I'm passionate about the view, and I think many other people are here as well, that science is a liberal art. Um, you heard earlier on, I don't mean to take issue with the first speaker, uh, that wonderful thought experiment of putting everything in organic chemistry into a pill. Um, I could show you my own transcript grades in organic chemistry, and I would have benefited from that pill. So I'd be first in line to take it. But it, interestingly, it suggests something. And it suggests, for example, that organic chemistry is a bunch of stuff that you learn. And when you learn it, you've got it. The answer is, that's not true. It's not true for orgo. It's not true for immunology. It's not true for anything else. Science involves learning stuff. You have to know what people did before. If you're going to major in English, you really ought to know what Shakespeare wrote. But you also ought to understand the context of creativity in terms of Shakespeare or the context of discovery in terms of science. Because every single fact, every single alkene, every single structure, every single SN1 and SN2 reaction in organic chemistry, I see some of you are wincing right now, <laughs> was in fact discovered by someone who applied extraordinary creativity to it. Now, the, to me, the thing about a Brown education and our unwillingness to say, here's the core, here's what you must learn, is that very often it doesn't work. And what I mean by that is it is very possible at Brown to take the course of least resistance, try to find an easy way out, and just go ahead and do it. And there is no core curriculum, there's no set of distribution requirements to force you into that Western Civ course, to force you to learn a language, to force you to take higher mathematics or anything else. That's up to you. And I think very often we fail at this. And we graduate students who basically don't have the kind of knowledge that we expect. But we also succeed in ways that I don't think are possible with any other educational system. When I talk to my colleagues at other universities and they say, how does that curriculum work? I say, it works here, but it wouldn't work everywhere. It works for a special kind of student, the kind of student who says, I want to construct my own education. And like everything that anybody ever tries, Sometimes when you try to do it yourself, you mess it up and you fail. Sometimes you succeed and you succeed brilliantly. But either way, you learn a lesson. And the important lesson essentially is that you are capable of taking the world of knowledge, organizing it, and constructing it in a way that makes sense for you. So I think in some total, um, and I hate to think about this, I've been here as a faculty member for 31 years. Um, there isn't any place that I would leave Brown for, and that's not because this is the greatest university in the world. It's not. It's not because this is the best place to do research. It's not. It's not because it's absolutely the best place to teach, because it's not. There are other universities and situations with better resources, maybe with higher pay, with better research facilities and so forth and so on. Not by much, but certainly, certainly there. But what is different about this place is the attitude that faculty and students bring to it about constructing knowledge and constructing their own education. And to me, that's the most extraordinary thing about this place. That's what makes this a great place for me to be a scientist and to teach science. And that's what makes this experience special beyond all belief and valuable beyond all measure. Thanks.